Shakespeare'in e, çok güzel oyunları ve içinde çok güzel sözleri var. Bunların bir tanesini, bir tanesi tabi oyunun içinde bir tirat, onun başlığı yok ama ona bir başlık konmuş o tiratın. Seven Ages of Men diyor. İşte, All the world is a stage diye başlıyor, gidiyor, gidiyor, gidiyor, sayıyor. Işte. İnsanın yedi aşaması varmış yaşadığında. Tabi biraz cinsiyetçi erkek üzerine yazmış arada, yani öyle anlaşılıyor gibi şimdi. Önemli değil aslında o ayrımlar var ama hani bazı ifadeler daha erkeğe uygun gibi. O işin parantez içi. Sonunda şey diyor, last scene of all. Yani işte biz de oraya geldik. Last scene of all ama bunun gerisi pek bizim yaptıklarımıza uymuyor. That ends the strange event for history. Diye işte bitmeye başlıyor. Evet, biz de oraya geldik. Neymiş? Yani, Lederman, Melvin Schwartz and Jack Steinberger discovered the mu neutrino. Bu, this, this was suggested before. Uh, that muons must have a, a neutrino associated with them. Just like the first neutrino Pauli suggested and Fermi named was uh, related uh, to Electron. In 1961, Sheldon Glashow developed the theory of the intermediate bosons for electroweak interactions. You know, now what's that? I told you that today what we know about, what we believe to be, and Apparently, it is also uh, it is also a kind of supported by experimental evidence that uh, electrical force is mediated, carried by photons. Nuclear forces are mediated by mesons, but not quite. First was thought to be mesons, but later on it was on, uh, realized that now this is on more or less started now. It started, it's starting in 1960s that there are things called quarks. Just a strange name, but that's all right. Uh, and uh, the weak interaction, which is weak and slow, because. <coughs> It is mediated by very heavy objects. Very heavy objects. Uh, these are called a intermediate, uh, intermediate bosons. They gave names for them, letters W and Z. W has two uh, charges, plus, minus, of course, and there is a neutral one. And uh, they are very, very heavy uh, siblings. <coughs> Sibling, you know what sibling means? Who doesn't know? Okay. I learned that very, very late. That's why I ask sometimes whether you know. Uh, heavy siblings of photons. Glashow will be one of those people who uh, would suggest and get Nobel Prize for that. Well, in a few years. Same year, Murray Gelman and independently Yuval Neyman, the Spicer and Jay Tarski introduces what would be called the eightfold way to classify what would be called Hadrons, hadrons. Hadrons are things that uh, interact with strong force. Eightfold way is a term terminology in, in Buddhism. I don't 
quite know what the details of it are. The thing is that I'm not going to uh, <coughs> all of it, just to give some indication of why eight fold. See, neutron, proton, and many other particles that don't worry about names, let's call them X, Y, Z, U, V. And there is also a Y prime that sits here. Now, apparently there must be three axes in. Uh, imagine that this is a coordinate system with three axes. And these positions are coordinates of these objects in this three-fold uh, space. There are names for these axes. For uh, Some of them are familiar concepts. Some of them are not so familiar concepts. So you see, two of them sit here. So there are eight particles. This actually suggests that in reality, in, in, in the origin, in the formation of these things, they were all, one, they are all one single object. <coughs> but uh, these objects have uh, different quantum numbers. These three, they have three different uh, quantum numbers, and uh, they are placed, uh, classified in this manner. So eight in one, one in eight, or something like that. That's why it's called eightfold way. It's a mysterious or uh, kind of a uh, culture. Just to give a name, they uh, kind of liken the situation to this uh, concept in Buddhism. <coughs> Many other particles also uh, classified this way. And furthermore, when they are given extra energy, they, uh, they, they uh, just would blow out into ten-fold uh, system. And that ten-fold system will, will, be, will be something like that eventually. One thing in the middle, uh, one here and uh, two more here, something like that. And of course, here, here. So uh, 10 particles, they, they, when they blow out uh, excited, there will be only one left at the center. And this, whatever it would sit over there, will be uh, and the subject of the Nobel Prize for this uh, person, Murray Gelman. Robert Hofstadter, an, a, an experimental, discovers through electron scattering that protons and neutrons are not point particles. That is, they have internal structure. They discovered, uh, Hofstadter discovered in his uh, experiments with electron scattering with very high energy electrons, uh, uh, probes, protons, and neutrons, and he sees some kind of charge distribution in these things. So neutron is only neutral. It's not chargeless. Sometimes they uh, translate neuter, neutral as <coughs> Yüksüz in Turkish. It's, it's definitely wrong. Mm -hmm. An atom is n neutral, but it's not chargeless. You know, it contains charge. A molecule is, all the objects are neutral, essentially, but they are not chargeless. And also, neutron and proton, well, proton has charge, so it's not a serious situation. But neutron contains charge in it contains equal amounts of positive and negative charges. That's what uh, started to be understood through this experiment by Hofstadter. <coughs> Dunby in 62 uh, and collaborators established that there is another kind of neutrino 
Well, they also apparently, like Schwartz and Steinberger, uh, uh, find uh, neon neutrino. So they uh, kind of uh, verify the other finding. A, a Russian scientist, Lev Okun, introduces the name Hadron, the name Hadron for strongly interacting particles. Now this Lev Okun did something else too. I mentioned to you when discussing the special relativity, the masses, uh, uh, etc., that an object, when it's moving, its mass doesn't increase. Its kinetic energy increases, but it's not part of its mass. It's never part of its mass. <coughs> All of its ma mass of this thing. But the atoms and molecules, when moving inside, their kinetic energy is added to the mass of this object. Although people in a very serious works uh, uh, use this fact, but when coming to talk about it in, in ordinary classroom lectures, there is always this mass uh, varying with speed. This I told you that is because people wanted to write P S M V. This is the classical definition. They didn't want to write it as M gamma V as a factor, and they said M gamma is M V, something like that. But this is ridiculous, it doesn't work. Lev Okun in 1980s insisted that one shouldn't use this. This is not a very uh, uh, instructive way of uh, teaching, a uh, very, very pedagogical way of teaching physics. It confuses, it leads to some kind of a wrong uh, consequences, etc., uh, etc. Et so that's why Lev Okun is also an important person. Brian Josephson predicts, he was a young graduate student uh, when he did that, Josephson jun Junction for superconductor conducting materials. That would lead to very important uh, technological results. Uh, so, really, really. Uh, uh, <coughs> serious uh, achievement for a young uh, student. 1963, Nicola, Nicola Kabibo develops a theory of weak interactions related to modern electroweak theory. Now what the hell is electroweak theory? As I said, starting with Glashow, uh, it would be understood that electrical forces, that is electromagnetic forces, uh, one of the two forces that is very uh, uh, immediately important for ordinary, uh, ordinary life, let's say, uh, gravitation and uh, electromagnetic forces, they will find that these two uh, apparently very, very uh, different forces, uh, uh, electrical and, well, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, gravitation is just a side. They couldn't get uh, join, the, join it with the others, but the weak interactions, the beta decay, things like that, neutrinos, electrons, and uh, electrical <laughs> charges are really much uh, like siblings again. Uh, so uh, it's a family. We'll say more about it, little more, little more, not very really much later on. Electroweak theory. <laughs> Gelman in 1964 finally introduces the concept of quarks as fractionally charged particles as constituents of hadrons. 
and predicts the existence of omega minus particle, this one. You see, uh, all the others uh, sitting in this triangle, corners and interior of this triangle, whatever it is, have been discovered and people were trying to system find the systematics for those. And Gelman finally uh, pointed out such a systematics, which was to be supported by that internal structure of neutrons and protons. Gelman uh, explained that neutrons and protons are made out of three other objects. Uh, these three objects, uh, the first uh, one, uh, these three objects essentially contain two uh, new particles that they might call quarks. One is, uh, one carries a, an electrical charge of, now it's a surprise to everybody, people just didn't like it for a long time, but now they are all accepted. <coughs> it contains, one of them has positive two-thirds of the charge of an electron. And the other has charge of uh, minus one-third uh, of charge of the electron. Well, charge, well, proton, if you like, we say. You see, it's, it's a very interesting situation. Proton has two of those two-third positive charges and one minus one-third of those charges. So you add them, you get plus one positive charge. Neutron, on the other, has uh, two of negative one-third particles and one plus two-third particles, positive two-third particles. So you add them up, you get zero, so it's neutral. With this uh, internal construction, he uh, formed all the particles that sit in this uh, triangle and also in the eightfold six hexagon. Uh, in, but then this uh, apex was left free and looking at the properties of all the others, just like Mendeleev did for germanium, a casilicon, you remember, he suggested that there must be a particle up there with such a mass, with such a charge, with such other type of uh, uh, quantum numbers. And uh, next year or so, it was discovered. Same year, same year. Nicola Samios and others discovered the omega minus particle predicted by quark theory of Gelman. So that led Gelman to be uh, receiving a Nobel Prize uh, in, in near future. Nicola, well, you see, Samios was not given the prize because he found something that was suggested by somebody else. Just like uh, Mrs. Wu didn't get Nobel Prize for parity non conservation experiments. Because she was suggested by uh, Young and uh, Li and Young. You see, about this suggestion business, I uh, have uh, mentioned to you about this nuclear shell theory that was suggested by Maria Goethe Meyer in Chicago and Jensen in, in Germany, separately, <coughs> independently. You see, what happened was that people applied uh, atomic physics ideas to nuclei, and that would suggest some uh, numbers where some kind of shells filled, you know, in, just like in the atoms, to a something like that. But in nuclei, uh, nuclear forces require a little bit different situation. But the numbers they extract from that theory did not agree with the experimental findings. The experiments would suggest different type of numbers for nucleons to give uh, 
uh, the appropriate magic numbers, let's say. Different numbers. After first few, they didn't agree. Well, what? Maria Schöpfer Mayer was working on this problem in Chicago University, where Fermi was a professor of physics, in a party. Uh, by the way, Maria Göppert, and her husband's name is, I forgot his name, he, he was also a really prominent physicist, some, some Maya, I don't know, Maya. Anyway, uh, you see, in the United States, in many universities, a husband and wife cannot work in the same uh, department. Uh, as faculty members, as professors. Mm -hmm. But as researchers, they can. So somehow, her husband was already a professor, so she, did, she was only a research associate. Well, these are just details. In a party, uh, <coughs> the university or somewhere, I don't know, Maya, Maria Meyer and Fermi were dancing. And uh, Maria Meyer asked Fermi about, well, complained about the situation that she couldn't get these uh, magic numbers appropriately. And Fermi asked her uh, what she did, essentially. She said, I did this and did that. And Fermi said, have you considered spin-orbit coupling? Forget about it. If you, uh, if you learn advanced quantum mechanics, you'll learn what it means. It's a situation where in the atoms one sees uh, the orbital uh, angular momentum and the spin have some kind of an interaction. And Fermi asked Maria Meyer, <laughs> about this, and she said, oh, no, I'll try it. She tried it, and uh, she got a Nobel Prize for that. Mm -hmm. Actually, the problem was solved by Fermi. But the rest was the idea should receive the prize. That's the way people usually think. Anyway, so. Um, this business. Uh, uh, same idea also introduced by George Zweig, but uh, he, he gave the name ACE for these uh, quarks. Quark, in uh, some European languages, is the name of kind of a cheese, lord, lord kind of cheese. You know. Law. But uh, uh, Gelman says that he uh, gave this name after uh, a poem, long poem by James Joyce, who writes in a very uh, strange language in English, but in a very strange language. Somewhere he says, three cards for Master Mark. Actually, apparently this should be called card, but Everybody calls it cork. <laughs> uh, anyway, this is the story. <coughs> then Glashow and James Bjorken suggest the existence of the fourth cork. Actually, uh, who, uh, uh, Yelman suggested two corks, three corks, two ordinary corks that make neutron and proton. And a third chord, which would stand for the strangeness that I mentioned before, that V particle. Well, these are details that are not very easy to remember, but just well, I'm mentioning them to complete the story. And the, the thing is that this object that uh, <coughs> Gelman suggested contains two of these chords. All the others have one. When it's at the apex, that means its strangeness uh, coordinate has two uh, units, uh, something like that. Now, uh, Bjorken and uh, Glashow suggest the existence of the fourth, 
to, uh, and, and for that, he gave the name Charm. Um, the others, neutron, ordinary ones, are now called up and down. Up is two third unit, down is one third. Uh, these are just names. Uh, uh, they don't have direct physical meaning associated with these, just names. Uh, and then strange for the object. And uh, for the fourth quark, these people call charm. Now, charm in Turkish uh, doesn't have an immediate uh, uh, immediate uh, anyway, whatever uh, name. Uh, we call it too simple sometimes because charm also has something to do with magic. But the actual meaning when you hear it, uh, one of the ladies have those bracelets with little uh, objects hanging on them. Does any one of you have anything like that? that well, once, you know, years ago it was very fashionable. All the girls would carry bracelets with little odd objects like a bell or a... Uh, I don't know, shoe or a, a, a bird, whatever, all these things. And these are called charms, charm black man. The name is charm bracelet. That's why the name is given to that object, for charm bracelet. Anyway, Peter Higgs, well, Peter Higgs became very uh, famous. Uh, and independently, Robert Braut and Francois Englert <coughs> suggest a mechanism to give mass to elementary particles. You know, all the theories about particles cannot say anything about the mass. The masses are just whatever they have, what is measured. Now, these, thing, these people say, well, where, where in the hell does this, this mass come from? So they invent a mechanism in 1964. And 1964 to 2014, let's say, 50 years. 50 years later, more or less, this object uh, is uh, <laughs> kind of observed. Observed Higgs, Higgs field and its particle Higgs boson. <coughs> The mechanism they suggest is something like that. There is what is called X field. The space is full of this X field. Uh, it's, it's like a large spread of mud. <coughs> so when these particles are moving in this mud, this mud causes friction that leads to inertia, and you know from Newton's laws that inertia is mass, or mass is inertia. That's how the simplest description of this thing can be made. Muddy, uh, muddy field. And just like all the physical fields that we know uh, have uh, these quanta, electromagnetic field has its quantum as photon, things like that. Well, let's see. Mu Young Han <coughs> and Yuchiro Nambu introduced the concept of color for quarks to make them obey all the principles. You see, a neutron and proton, the simplest ones, have uh, what uh, three quarks in them, all in the same state. At least two of them are in the same state. Now. They must be fermions because three odd now is an odd number. Proton is a fermion, so each one of these three must be fermions. <coughs> but two of them are in the same state. <coughs> fermions must obey Pauli principle. So these people say that aha, uh -huh, there is another quantum number associated with these objects, <coughs> and he calls it color. He associates color red, blue, uh, and uh, magenta, or uh, 
yellow, whatever, it depends on the uh, taste. It's not really important. So, and actually, when it is further interpreted, uh, the proton or neutron do not, do not have color quantum number. So, must be <coughs> three colors must be <coughs> combined to give white. In uh, color theory, ordinary <coughs> color theory, there are three colors that combine to give you white. You can look up in, in the appropriate books. So well, it's better to, to talk about these three colors. Okay, uh, let's give a break.